Hi guys, it's Mrs. Lacewell again, and I am reading the very end part of Hatchet by Gary Paulson to you. So in this recording, I'm going to read the epilogue, survival tips, and frequently asked questions for Gary Paulson. Um, last time in the book, Brian looked through all the things in the survival pack, and he had lots of food, and he had soap, and he had fishing line, he had a rifle, and he had all these things. And the most important thing is there was an emergency transmitter that he turned on. So um, as he was cooking his dinner... A uh, plane flew over, landed in the lake, and saved him. So we're going to find out what happens next at the very end. So, epilogue. The pilot who landed so suddenly in the lake was a fur buyer mapping Cree trapping camps for future buying runs. Drawn by Brian when he unwittingly turned on the emergency transmitter and left it going. The Cree move into the camps for fall and winter to trap, and the buyers fly from camp to camp on a regular route. When the pilot rescued Brian, he'd been alone on the L-shaped lake for 54 days. During that time, he'd lost 17% of his body weight. He later gained back 6%, but had virtually no body fat. His body had consumed all extra weight, and we'd remain lean and wiry for several years. Many of the changes would prove to be permanent. Brian had gained immensely in his ability to observe what was happening and react to it. That would last him all his life. He had become more thoughtful as well, and from that time on, he would think slowly about something before speaking. Food. All food. Even food he didn't like. Never lost its wonder for him. For years after his rescue, he would find himself stopping in grocery stores just to stare at the aisles of food, marveling at the quantity and the variety. There were many questions in his mind about what he had seen and known, and he worked at research when he got back, identifying the game and berries. Gut cherries were termed choke cherries and made good jelly. The nut bushes where the full birds hid were hazelnut bushes. The two kinds of rabbits were snowshoes and cottontails, and full birds were called ruffed grouse, also called fool hens by trappers for their stupidity. The small food fish were bluegills, sunfish, and perch. The turtle legs were laid by a snapping turtle, as he had thought. The wolves were timber wolves, which were not known to attack or bother people, and the moose was a moose. There was also the dreams. He had many dreams about the lake after he was rescued. The Canadian government sent a team in to recover the body of the pilot, and they took reporters who naturally took pictures and film the whole campsite, the shelter, all of it. For a brief time, the press made much, made much of Brian, and he was interviewed for several networks. But the fur died within a few months. A writer showed up who wanted to do a book on the complete adventures, he called it. But he turned out to be a dreamer, and all came to nothing but talk. Still, Brian was given copies of the pictures and the tape, and looking at them seemed to trigger the dreams. They were not nightmares. None of them were frightening. But he'd waken at times with them, just awaken and sit up and think of the lake, the forest, the fire at night, the night bird singing, the fish jumping. Sit in the dark alone and think of them. And it wasn't bad. It would never be bad for him. Predictions are, for the most part, ineffective, but it might be interesting to note that had Brian not been rescued when he was, had he been forced to go into hard fall, perhaps winter, it would have been very rough on him. When the lake froze, he would have lost the fish, and when the snow got deep, he would have had trouble moving at all. Game becomes seemingly plentiful in the fall. It's easier to see with the leaves off the brush, but in winter it gets scarce and sometimes simply non-existent as predators, fox, lynx, wolves... Um, owls, weasels, fisher, martin, the northern coyote sweep through areas and wipe things out. It's amazing what a single owl can do to a local population of ruff ruffled grouse and rabbits in just a few months. After the initial surprise and happiness from his parents at his being alive, after a week it looked as if they might actually get back together, things rapidly went back to normal. His father returned to the northern, northern oil fields, where Brian eventually visited him, and his mother stayed in the city. Worked at her career in real estate and continued to see the man in the station wagon. Brian tried several times to tell his father, really came close once doing it, but in the end, never said a word about the man or what he knew. The secret. Okay, that's the end of the book. Now, before I read through the survival part and the fre frequently asked questions, um, you might want to know, there actually are other books about Brian. So, there's a Brian... Uh, a book called Brian's Winter, which is basically an alternate ending to Hatchet. That's what would happen if Brian did have to survive throughout the winter. So, Brian's Winter by Gary Paulson is like an alternate ending to Hatchet. It's really good. Um, if you like this book, go read it. There's also a second and a third book. One's called 
Brian's Return, when Brian returns to the lake. I think that's the third one. And the second one, I believe, is called The River. Um, and it's about Brian going on a camping trip down like this white water rapids. So if you really like this book, go look at the other books about Brian by Gary Paulson. Okay, so this is Gary Paulson's uh, survival guide. So tip number one says keep your head where your feet are. Take a deep breath, stay calm. Look around and observe your surroundings and assess your resources. You know more than you think you do. Second tip, find shelter. Figure out some way to keep the sun and the rain off you and protect yourself from the wind. Tip number three, find water. You can only go about three days without hydration. Step number four, make a fire. The rock thing really does work if you're persistent and patient. Step five, arm yourself with something to be used as a weapon, a fish hook, a spear, and try to find a way to catch food. Again, look around you. Nature will help provide you with what you need if you pay attention and think ahead. Okay, so now this is what Gary Paulson says about reading. Here's his tips for reading. So tip number one is read like a wolf eats. Read all the time. Read everything. Read every day. Read what they tell you to read and read what they tell you not to read. Just read. Tip number two about reading. We're the only species that saves our knowledge and passes it to future generations in books. Tip number three. A librarian who handed me a book made everything in my whole life possible. If not for that one lady handing me a book and saying, here, I think you'll like this, nothing good in my life would ever have happened. So for him, reading really was a catalyst um, or a thing that made other things happen for him. Tip number four, I have always read books more than once. First, because I'm such a terrible reader, I forget what I read and have to go back every other page and remind myself. And now because I study how other writers put the words on the page. And then tip number five for reading, a few of my books are only written because readers kept asking what happened next. There are a few authors I wish I could write to and ask for more. And then Gary Paulson has some tips on writing. So if you want to become a writer, write stories, which is really fun to do. Um, if you want to do that for a career or if you just want to do it for fun, here are his tips. Tip number one, write every day, every single day. No excuses, no exceptions. Tip number two, if you want to write, you have to read every single day. No excuses, no exceptions. Tip number three, keep your pen or your fingers on the keys moving. Don't worry about being good. Just get words on paper. You can fix it later, but you can't improve what never made it to the page in the first place. Step four, set your writing aside for a while. You need the perspective of time and distance from what you've written in order to see where you can improve. I always have a couple of books going at once so I can focus on something else and give myself a break. And then tip number five for writing. Don't give up. Don't you ever, ever, ever give up. Hatchet was originally rejected and I had to send it to another editor. So there's his tips on writing. Last part, frequently ask questions. Question number one, where do you get your ideas? Personal inspection at zero altitude. I write what I know and what I've seen and what I've studied. Question number two, was Brian a real person? And then Gary Paulson says, I made him up. He is a part of me when I was a kid and I used the loneliness of my childhood and the experience I had in the woods to help make Brian feel as real as I could. Number three, how do you write so many books? And he says, I read every single day and I write every single day. Question number four, what's your favorite book that you've written and that you've read? He says, my favorite book that I've written is always the next one. And the books that I've learned the most from reading are the Patrick O'Brien Aubrey Maturin series. I, re I read those books over and over and learn from them every single time. Then chapter five, what's next? And he says, I'm not sure. I just keep keep flipping between three or four, sometimes more, book ideas right now. I've got more stories in my mind than I'll, I'm sure I'll ever have time to finish. I'm never really sure what's next. After all these years and all these books, there's never been a plan or a schedule. I just keep working on all of them, and the first one that's complete is the next one I send to my editor. So that's the end of Hatchet. Picture of a pine cone. I hope you enjoyed this story. Um, go read some more books by Gary Paulson if you enjoyed this one. I'm sure you'll find some other adventures that you love, and I'll see you next time.